Well, an armor bearer is someone who will stand beside, assist, lift up, and protect. Someone who will serve. So let's pick it up here now. It says, Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. See, here's what Jonathan had in his mind. He was there with his uh, armor bearer, and he decides that those two are going to go over against the entire army of the Philistines. You know, and I like what he said. He said, it may be that the Lord will, will work for us. You know, the other side of that statement is, he may not. You know, it may be, this is a bad idea. <laughs> it may be that this ain't going to work out very good. But you know what? I'd rather do something than nothing. And so instead of just sitting there waiting, he decided to put his faith to work in God because he already had a track record of knowing God moved. And so, you know, he, it, you know, he, te- he says to his armor bearer there, the guy that's with him, hey, come on, let's, let's just do this. And, and I know what you're thinking. You might have said to, the, to Jonathan, man, you're crazy. I ain't, I'm not doing that. That's, that's suicide. But look what he said, verse number seven. So his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am. I'm with you according to your heart. See, and here's a picture of how God does things in the kingdom. We do them together. Jonathan might have had the idea, but personally, even though there was only two of them, I don't believe he could have been successful without the other guy with him. The Bible says if one can put 1,000 to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. So us coming into agreement is vitally important to what we're doing in the kingdom of God. So whenever God gives me one of these crazy ideas, you know, right now we're trying to negotiate with the city a free building that they'll pay for to start doing job training with money from the county that will actually pay people to come in and train people to have jobs. You know, Microsoft certifications, and, and we're working on even uh, some things like uh, finished carpentry and some things like that, because not everybody's got the aptitude for computers. We believe that we can do something in this time when everybody's sitting around wringing their hands. There's money sitting in the bank. I told the mayor pro tem, I said, look, we're going to write a grant to try to get some money. And she goes, I don't think you need to do that. There's money in the county sitting there waiting for something like this. Well, give it up, you know. So it sounds like a silly idea, but, you know, as God speaks those things and then we catch fire on those things, that's how he brings them to pass. Whenever I have one of these things that he drops on me, it's not for me, it's for us, see? And so the armor bearer comes alongside, and I believe God's raising up a generation now of men and women, old and young alike, that are going to lay down their own agendas and begin to seek his will for their lives. And friends, listen to me, if we can figure this out, then our children can also walk in it. And this just has never been done, Uh, not on a large scale anyway, because we're so uh, saturated with our culture's mentality that everything we do has got to be about us. I mean, that armor bearer didn't say, man, I need a confirmation. God's going to have to speak to me himself. No, he didn't say that. Why? Because he trusted the leadership of Jonathan. He'd already been in battle. He'd already seen God move for Jonathan. So therefore, his heart was knit. And then they went over against the entire army of the Philistines that looked absolutely impossible, and they were victorious. Why? Because they had faith in God. It had nothing to do with Jonathan hearing it first or the armor bearer not hearing it from God or whatever the case may be. Their hearts were united, and because of that, God moved. So now I just want to hit three quick things that I want to share with you today, and then we're going to call it a day. The first thing is God has a place for us. God has a place for us. Go with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 12, 18. 1 Corinthians 12, 18. I've been praying about this series. Like I told you, there was a couple of things that I wanted to bring out, and then the Lord just showed me how to tie it all together into a three- or four-week series. We're in week number two. And he is, uh, he's showing us, I think, I think some very life-changing things. So here we are in 1 Corinthians 12, 18, and it says, But now God has set members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. Wow, just as he pleased. Look back at me just for a moment. Now, here's the thing. When's the last time God came and tapped you on the shoulder and said, Hey, listen, I'm thinking about bringing somebody into the church. Is that okay with you? Or how about, hey, I'm thinking about promoting such and such. Is that all right with you? Does that meet your your specification. See, that doesn't happen because God doesn't ask our opinion. 
He does things in the church as it pleases him. So just look around, guys. This is your church. This is where God put you because it pleased him. This is where he put that person that you don't like because it pleased him. And maybe he put that person here that you don't like so that you'd be forced to do the hard work of getting over issues instead of saying, okay, I don't like that, so I'm going to go. Because listen, here's what I found out in my life, that wherever you go, there you are. So whatever issues you had at the last place that you don't deal with in this place, you'll have at the next place. So why don't we just say, devil, get off me. I'm putting my feet down in covenant blood, and I'm getting over some stuff because I'm not running. I'm not turning, and I'm going to stay where God put me because that's where his presence, power, provision, and peace is going to be. Now, listen, it's not the peace that says there's no problems. It's the peace that passes understanding because your head's telling you, I shouldn't have kind of this kind of peace. But it's the peace in knowing that the enemy attacks you where he doesn't want you to be. So if God put you here, I would be willing to bet that you've had opportunity to be offended, to be hurt, and to think about leaving. And that, to me, is proof that you're where you're supposed to be. Amen? Because why does the devil need to mess with you and try to dislodge you if you're where he wants you to be? If he's happy, he has no reason to garrison his forces in an area that does not uh, portend him any harm. I'm telling you, he'll come against you, but you'll have the peace that passes understanding because God put you there. Amen? All right, let's go to 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17, uh, and we'll just jump in here in verse 2 and two through 4. Now, Elijah has just prophesied a drought for Ahab and his bunch. And so he's not the most popular guy in town right now. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Underline that. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from that brook, or the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. I want you to circle that word there. Notice that God didn't say to him, now listen, Elijah, i got to relocate you. But when I do, listen, you need to just pick it. There needs to be a stream involved and some ravens involved. Now you got the brook Cherith here, and it's, a, and it's adequate. Or you got the Brook Kedron over here. It's, it's a little more crowded, but the beaches are nicer and the palm trees are bigger. And then you got this brook over here, and then you got that one over there. So you just pick one. They're all, they all have water flowing through them, and they all have a place where the birds can fly by. So you just pick where you want to go. And there I'll feed you. He didn't say that, did he? He said, you go to the Brook Cherith, and I'll feed you there. See, sometimes we think we have more decision-making ability than we do. Sometimes we think we can decide stuff that God says, that's not your choice. See, now I'm talking the perfect will of God. I'm not saying that you can't be somewhere he didn't put you, and then you can't still live like the Israelites in the wilderness. He still fed them. They had air conditioning. They had heat. And they all died in the wilderness to a man except Caleb and Joshua. See, they were in his permissive will. Not his perfect will. But if you want to be in his perfect will, then you got to go where he says. The Bible says the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And they told him, he said, you go there and I'll feed you there. Okay? Now, let me show you. Just drop on down. Then, verse 8, the word of the Lord came to him saying, arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Circle that word there. See? I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So now here's the thing. There came a time when that brook was no longer sufficient to support Elijah. And so it's not that you can't ever leave where you are. But notice how he left. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. 